Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to another episode of UMass Sports Weekly. I'm your host, Casey Johnston. Good show lined up for you tonight. We're going to start it off with basketball. We're going to recap the really good season the Minutemen had and also look at a very disappointing finish in the tournament. A lot to talk about there. We're going to follow that up, take it over to the diamond for both the men and the women's baseball and softball. Tough start on the men's side. We'll get to the women's as well. A lot to talk about there as well. Then we'll follow that up with the Boston Sports Test with our very own Adamo Pull Zone, and then wrap it up with men's and women's lacrosse. This is UMass Sports Weekly. This is UMass Sports Weekly. Welcome to UMass Sports Weekly, coming back after our spring break hiatus. Now joining me at the table to discuss UMass men's basketball, Chris Potomatis and Mark Jean-Louis. Guys, welcome back. How was spring break? Good break? Good, break. Good, Good week break. off. Good to hear. That's the generic question around here, so I figured I'd keep it going. Uh, UMass basketball, we could take the entire show if we wanted to, to talk about UMass basketball, but we're going to sum it up for you for a bit here. Uh, we followed them all season. Really good season for the Minutemen, you know, it was, a lot of what people were hoping for. Got in the tournament just like people were hoping for. Uh, but just a, a rough finish. Losing to Tennessee uh, wasn't a pretty game pretty much the entire time. UMass was a six seed coming into the tournament. Uh, Tennessee was an 11 seed that had to get in through a playing game. Uh, just a, a lot going on in the tournament. But first, let's, let's just talk about the Tennessee game. Chris, why don't you start us off? Well, I think the, it was certainly a rough game when you watch it. They were down 19 and a half. They kind of dug themselves a quick hole, and it seemed like it was the same game that we've been watching for the second half of the season. Well, unfortunately, UMass, I think it was the defense was the problem. They just let the team score too easily. They dig themselves a hole. And if you're playing URI, you can probably get out of that hole. Mm -hmm. But if you're playing a good team, even just an average team, you're going to have a hard time getting out of that hole. And in the NCAA tournament, I just thought they gave Tennessee way too much momentum, and they were really never able to fight back to it. They got it back within 10 at one point in the second half, but after that, Tennessee kind of stopped the bleeding, extended the lead, and really, I thought it was the big man for Tennessee that just had the at-right advantage. John L. Stokes, 26 points, 14 rebounds. He was a beast in that game. The, the other big man, Maiman, he was also a beast. He matched, just had no answer for those guys down low. Tennessee was just the more physical team. They shot well from the floor, over 50%, and really just, uh, you know, from the get-go, it looked like UMass had no chance after they got down quickly. Yeah, when you say big man for Tennessee, Huge. emphasis on the big there. Absolutely. They, I mean, we got some big guys in Caddy Lane and in Raphael Putney. I know Putney's not there with the weight. I probably weigh more than he does. <laughs> but he's tall. He's up there at 6'9", 6, 6'10". Yeah. And these guys really just dwarfed our big men. I mean... Yeah. They were big in height, and they were big in weight, and it was muscle, and they were athletic, and they just didn't match up. And, uh, it, I mean, it, it, was, it was impressive to watch Tennessee outplay us so much. Yeah, and it seemed like they also had a lot of second chance points, too, mm -hmm. where it seemed like our right, UMass have a good defensive stop, but then all of a sudden Tennessee gets the rebound, easy put back, or they kick it out. Mm -hmm. And they still, again, they shot a higher percentage from the field. So it just seemed like UMass really had nothing going for them. They were out-rebounded. They committed a lot more fouls. And also, one more thing is that Tennessee shot 31 free throws and UMass shot 11. So that just tells you that Tennessee was more aggressive. They were getting to the free throw line. They were finishing. And really, Tennessee just absolutely controlled the game. And it was tough to see the season end that way. But what can you do with the NCAA tournament? Yeah, that foul shot differential, that's another story we've been hearing the entire season. Just... Did, I mean, it wasn't much of a difference in this game. I know it's 20 different free throw shots, but overall they were just outplayed the Absolutely. entire game. We've seen them lose games on free throws. Just another problem that added up. And, yeah, they just didn't really look ready for the type of competition that Tennessee was bringing. Mark, what did you take out of this game? I mean, even going back to the playing game between Iowa and Tennessee, I mean, just the way that Tennessee, they just completely dominated mm -hmm. Iowa in the second half to tie the game and then just completely blew them out and in the overtime period. And so when, when Tennessee won that game, I was just looking on that and was like, oh no, I know that if UMass gets a matchup against this team, they're gonna have some trouble. 
being able to stop their big man and Jerron Mame and, and Jarnell Stokes. Like you said, um, both of them six feet eight, 260 pounds. So there are some big guys at the mm -hmm. four and five. And you know, when you put Raphael Putney at our four, he's only what, six nine and 185. So you, you take that weight difference, 185, 260. Automatically, he's just gonna have a hard time right there. Yeah. And it definitely showed, I mean, um, John L. Stokes, he had a very easy time to paint 26 and 14. There was no one there who could stop him. Again, Jerron Maiman had 11 and 11, a double-double right there, and no one could stop him. And aside from inside the paint, also around the perimeter and outside the paint, too. I mean, Data was having a field day against, uh, against UMass. I mean, even some of their other players, Jordan McRae had 21 points, and uh, their other guard, Josh Richardson, had 15 points. So there's already four players there that got into double figures, mm -hmm. and... As far as UMass scoring, they, they just could not get the ball into the basket. In, in the first half, UMass, they shot 33% in the first half. I mean, they turned it on the second half, they, they shot 50%, but, but still by then, it was too late. Chaz only had 12 points, so it was an off night for him. Maxi Asho had 12, Derek Gordon had 10, but then after that, there wasn't much offense going for UMass. Yeah, you mentioned Jordan McRae of Tennessee. He played outstanding in that game. Mm -hmm. Really, I think, established himself as an games. NBA prospect, mm -hmm. uh, getting a lot of looks and... That, that, that was just nothing. They couldn't contain him. And Chris, we were talking about earlier, we saw plays where they're having breakaway layups, and there was the play Trey Davis is catching up, and it's just the tap on the forearm to yeah. foul yeah. where you know you got to grab him or you let him go. Yeah, that, that was frustrating, especially yeah. where a few times in the second half they're trying to make a run. They had it down to 10. They'd have it down to 12, 14. And all of a sudden, you know, they're sprinting, and it's a, you know, a little foul. I mean, you know, Tennessee, they have big players. Mm -hmm. They can go through contact and finish. And it was like, oh, and one, and one. Yeah. And Tennessee made their free throws. I think they shot like 77% from the free throw line. Mm -hmm. So really, I mean, it, I think Tennessee just dominated in every aspect. And the and ones, I mean, those are frustrating when, you know, the weak mm -hmm. fouls and the finishes. And just at that point, it's almost like enough's enough. Just let them score. You're not helping anyone, really. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. I mean, like, even, like, in – as far as defense goes, UMass, they just could not stop the force that um, Tennessee was going through the, the entire game. I mean, during, I mean, at one point, they were shooting like 68 70% from inside the yard. Yeah. So especially when you're shooting that good from inside the yard, it's tough to stop anyone, mm -hmm. let alone Tennessee. And even in the fast break points, I mean, UMass, they might get a shot off, or maybe they don't get a shot off. And then the fast break, they just completely got dominated. Um, Tennessee had 19 fast break points and UMass at 8. So again, it just shows you right there. Tennessee, they had much more athletic players than UMass. They were just not able to stop them, even though they do play a fast sort of game. Yeah, just a, a lot of, we could pick this part, pick <laughs> this game apart yeah. for the entire show. Uh, it, it, was, it was frustrating to watch because we were all looking forward to the tournament so much. Absolutely. But mm -hmm. we don't want to let that get lost in the crap talking that we're doing about the <laughs> Tennessee game. The fact that they did make the tournament. That was the ultimate goal at the beginning of the year. Yep. That's what everybody wanted to see. And I think they outdid everybody's expectations, including their own, including most of the country, when they became a six seed to get into the tournament. So it was a very good season for this team overall. Very exciting to watch. A lot of wins, a lot of good basketball out of the seniors. So we don't want to get that lost in this Tennessee game. So let's talk about this, this whole, the season as a whole for a bit. Got ranked as high as 13 at one point yep. in the country. Mm -hmm. We're ranked for multiple weeks. We're just outside the rankings for most of the season. So, I mean, overall, I would call this a season a success. Yeah, definitely I would. I mean, if for no other reason that UMass is back in the map. I mm -hmm. think now we started to see you know, UMass getting more transfers and more recruits, which is obviously you know, crucial. You know, we're losing seniors this year, so you have to replace them somehow. But, mm -hmm. but you're right. I think people are talking about UMass basketball, which is absolutely a key when you're talking. You're in the same state as Harvard, who made the NCAA tournament. BC and UConn's just right down the road to mm -hmm. another powerhouse. But, yeah, this season was good, and there was certainly a lot of hype, and rightfully so. You know, they went out, they beat BC at the Garden, which at the time was a big game. They beat LSU at home in the season opener, or in the home opener on ESPN. They beat, they, they go ahead, in the Charleston Classic, they beat uh, Nebraska, they beat New Mexico, who was number 19. They beat a lot of really solid teams. They beat BYU and Springfield. Mm -hmm. I think they scored 100 points 100 in that points, game, yep. and Chaz mm -hmm. went off. So, really, I thought this team, up until conference play, they played great. You know, were they, were they the, the 12th team in the country and ranked or and should they have been ranked higher than the teams like Duke? Maybe not, but I think they were hot. Other teams started off slower. But overall this year, it was, it was, it was a lot of fun to watch. Mm -hmm. it certainly mm -hmm. had a lot of talent. I mean, Chaz, I don't care what team you root for. Chaz is always fun to watch. You know, UMass plays an exciting brand of basketball, up, you know, up-tempo, push the pace, alley-oops. But yeah, I mean, this was a good season. You know, eight tenths competitive. I think they did pretty good. They were finished like six in the regular season. Mm -hmm. 
But, you know, overall, I think there's more positives than negatives. They got back to the NCAA tournament for the first time in 16 years. And I think it's definitely a good, you know, like a good building block. You know, and it's something to build upon now. Now that's the expectation mm -hmm. to get to the NCAA tournament. It's going to be tough because we're losing some key players. But overall, a lot more positives than negatives came out of this year. Yeah, you mentioned the seniors that we are losing. We are losing a solid core of yeah. this basketball team. And when you look at teams like that, it, it makes you nervous a lot of the times sure. when you're looking in the future years. But what's positive about this team, I think, is that this is a team that has been developed by Kellogg. This is a completely yes. Derek mm -hmm. Kellogg team. So all the recruits coming under are also Derek, Derek Kellogg recruits as well. Right. So there is some good that is coming up behind the senior class. We've Absolutely. seen some blinks of it in some uh, players that have played this season. I don't want to give any names out yet. Mark, why don't you go over uh, some of these guys that we saw this season that we're really going to be looking forward to in next season? I mean, I think the first... The first player that you need to um, start looking at is Trey Davis, who's going to be replacing Chaz Williams at the one position. I mean, there were some games this season where Trey Davis, he looked like the leader on the field. I mean, yep. you know how Chaz Williams, when he's on the field, you know, that's when things start happening. I mean, when you start putting Trey Davis in there, it's almost like as if nothing changed. I mean, like there were just some games where he can just go out there and lead the offense like he's going to be expected to do once Chaz Williams leaves. I mean, there were games where he put up 20 points, and he's, he's, passing, the ball, he's passing the ball around very well to mm -hmm. some of the other players, Derek Gordon. Maxi Esho, Derek Gordon, sorry, I said Derek Gordon, Derek Gordon already, excuse me, but Kelly Lane, but yeah, especially, so that's one of them, that's one of the players I'm going to be looking forward to, the Trey Davis. The other player I want to really look forward to next year is Clyde Santee. I mean, this is a guy who's a three-star recruit out of Texas, um, uh, number 57 point guard in the nation, so there you go, a top, a top, no, not top 50, sorry, top 75 guard in the nation, I mean, I think we, he's six feet seven, so I think that we can replace him with Samson, we can replace Samson Carter with him, and it's definitely going to go. It's definitely going to go a long way for UMass going forward. I think. So. Yeah, Santee has definitely got some bright spots around mm -hmm. him. Definitely a lot of hype around him as well. We saw some good stuff out of him during this season. So a lot going to be looked forward with him. Chris, he's not the only one we're going to be looking forward to as well. Yeah, I think we saw Demetrius Dyson get a lot of playing time this year. He has certainly had the most playing time out of any freshman. It'll be interesting to see if he can take that next step. I thought one player that was really, like you said, with the bright spot was Trey Davis. He was a guy, he came, he, an A-10 player, he came off the bench and averaged double figures, one of the best three-point shooters. So there's a lot of bright spots for this team. Derek Gordon looked good and got better <clears throat> as the season yep. went on. Mm -hmm. So really, I just think that, you know, it's, there is a lot of bright spots. We're losing some players, but we're also getting some more in development too. Yep, and the A-10 really only getting stronger. I right. saw six teams make the tournament. Right. And I just want to say, Chaz Williams got snubbed on A-10 player of the year. <laughs> Better numbers than Jordan Jet of yep. St. Louis in every single Not to category. Take from Jet, Not to take anything away except for the mm -hmm. A10 Player of the Year <laughs> award. That, right. I'll take that away and give it to Chaz. Mm -hmm. Guys, great stuff. We're rooting for Dayton right now, I'd say, right? Sweet Absolutely. 16 A10 repping. Good Rep stuff, there. guys. Probably Appreciate strong. it. Stay tuned. We'll be right back with baseball and softball. Number 17, St. Louis and UMass at the Mullen Center Sunday. Senior day for UMass as Chaz Williams, Raphael Putney, and Samson Carter take the court for the last time at the Mullen Center. First half action, Chaz Williams having a field day for the Minutemen. Williams connected from deep three times in the first half, first on the feed from Putney. Williams on Austin McGroom and Rob Lowe, steps back, takes a jumper, and knocks it down again. Here he is with the ball again, fakes out everybody with a deep three, Nothing but net on that one. Excuse me, guys, I'm coming inside. Puts up the shot and gets it to fall through. Williams with team lead 13 first half points and five assists. Some nice block shots by the Minutemen in the first half. SLU fast break. It's Mike McCall applying to the University of Layup, but he is rejected by Putney. Jordan or Jed, how about you? Yeah, I think I'll give it a shot, but Derek Gorn says, Uh, I don't think so. SLU would get it back together, though, in the first half. Mike McCall applies for the second time, this time over Chaz Williams, and gets accepted. Jordan Jet with the second application, and he's not denied on that shot. Jet with the ball, he finds Dwayne Evans all by himself in the corner. Evans with the shot, and he banks it through. UMass through one, leading 35-33, on to the second half. Chaz Williams with the ball, he gets into some traffic, but finds Derek Gordon for the rainbow jumper. Williams again, he decides to take it himself, puts up the shot, and now UMass is up five. Williams now dishing out some help, he finds Maxi Escher who takes it to the rack. UMass would have their largest lead, 56-49 with 5.48 left to go. Down the stretch, it's Rob Lowe who gets the feed from Jake Barnett, cuts the lead down to five. 
It's Barnett who finds Dwayne Evans on the inside working on Caddy Lane, puts up the shot, and now SLU is down two. Jordan Jet would prove to be monstrous for DeVille against down the stretch, scoring the team's last six points. He tied the game on this layup over Samson Carter before winning it with three seconds left to go. UMass is an excellent, excellent basketball team that uh, presents a lot of problems to anybody. And uh, I thought our guys really did a good job. I thought our ball handling got better the second half. We had 10th and a half, and I think we ended up with maybe these are old stats. I don't know, 14? 14. Uh, 14. And so that, that was beneficial to us. And uh, letting that team, how physical they are, to only six offensive rebounds was certainly, I thought, a good chore on our guys' part. And, uh, it's been a while since, you know, you guys had a conference title. And um, that's something we want to go out with, you know, um, just making the tournament or just being in the ball game isn't good enough for us. We, we're really trying to make something out of it and do something with it. So that's what we're going for. Welcome back to UMass Sports Weekly. Now joining me at the table to discuss Baseball and softball taking it to the diamond, making his faithfully awaited return to That's the right. table, Chris Corso. He's been interning. He's been missed. He's been thought about. How, how's the internship going? The internship's going well, but I'm, I'm very happy to be back today. Well, we're happy to have you back. I know this is going to be a <laughs> fantastic segment. And being overshadowed by Chris Corso's return, Caitlin Boyer, thank you for coming to the table as well. <laughs> so there's a... Uh, no, there's, there's not a lot of positives to talk about at the start of the season right now. Uh, not just records-wise, but we know there's also some injury issues, especially with the baseball team. Chris, hey, some bad news about the team. There's bad news for the team. Uh, their star and their best player, uh, senior Rob McClam, tore his ACL prior to the season. And talking to Coach Stone this week, he said there's going to be more than one player that's going to have to fill that role. He led the team in at-bats, hits, extra base hits, and total bases last season. So a team that already struggles on offense, you got your best player out for the season sitting out with a red shirt. You got to wait till next year to get his, uh, his senior production. So there's a couple guys in the lineup that have stepped up. There's one guy that stands out as a surprise, and that's Mike Gene Ellis. He's a freshman pitcher. He came up as a pitcher, and he's filled in as the three batter this season. So he's hitting 326. And he has 11 hits already as, as a freshman and, and, and not as many at-bats as uh, some of the upperclassmen have gotten. So he's been a real uh, surprise for the Minutemen and definitely for Coach Stone. Speaking with him, he was uh, very excited about uh, his freshman's performance so far. I mean, that's good. When you got one of your best players falling out, it actually it sounds kind of similar to the lacrosse team story we've been talking about having freshmen that you're not expecting to step up, yep. step up in the lineup. That's what, I mean, that's really what a team needs to succeed. Exactly, and a team that's been struggling on offense, lost 12 of their first 13 games. They come into this weekend and they had the series, their first A-10 series. They win two out of three against LaSalle. You saw eight runs in the first two games and then zero runs in the third game, but at least you're seeing some signs of life from this UMass offense. Yeah, it's very, very good to hear freshmen stepping up. That's always what we like to hear mm -hmm. for not just now, but for the future of the program as well. Now, as for the softball team, same kind of deal, not the best start. As far as wins go, I know not everyone judges off wins. We kind of like to. But, yeah, um, what have you seen so far with the softball team this season? So, with softball, right now they're on a five-game losing streak. They've been playing, obviously, down in Florida because it's a little bit too uh, cold up here. It still is. Uh, for <laughs> some, you know, serious softball. But um, they've only won three games against Butler, Ohio, and UConn. Um, but one of the things with the softball team this year is that Elaine Sortino – um, passed away. She lost her battle to cancer, and she was really the, you know, at the pinnacle of UMass softball. She led them to a lot of A-10 championships, to the College World Series. Um, so not having her there is probably, you know, hard for the team. Um, right now the interim coach is Christy Stefanoni, who um, was the assistant. Um, so, it's, you know, obviously it's a familiar face, but I think that Having that loss is hard for the team, but I know that they can continue everything that she had taught them because she was really at the uh, head of UMass softball for a while. But um, with this team, 
Um, Caroline Raymond in the circle, she's leading the team. Um, she really stepped up last year after the loss of Sarah Plord, who really, I mean, dominated UMass softball and was a key component. But Caroline Raymond was very impressive. Um, last year, her ERA was 3.97 uh, with 29 starts. And she really gets in there and she's dominant. As we know, softball is a very fast-paced game, a lot faster than baseball. For sure. Um, and she really steps up in there. She's strong. She's dominant. I know her drop ball is very dangerous. So, I, I mean, I'm always impressed when I watch her, and I think that she really leads the team. I mean, she's a senior now. She's been doing this for a while. And when you're in that pitching position, you ultimately really do lead the team. I mean, you're setting the pace, and I'm, you know, uh, looking at her, I feel like she's, you know, mm -hmm. she's going to lead the way. And then... Um, we also have Kiana Diaz Patterson at shortstop. Um, she's also offensively very powerful um, in clutch situations. So, you know, it might be a little bit of a slow start right now down in Florida. Uh, but we'll, I think that it's still early, so let's not fret. Uh, they were supposed to open today against BC, but it was postponed due to ice. So that is New England winter for you. Uh, so yeah, been miserable. Yeah, been, uh, still still cold, almost April. Still uh, still below freezing yeah, out there. Hopefully next week. You hate, but uh, hope you know. I, th I think you were saying it earlier uh, out in the room that we've seen this with the softball team that they've struggled at the beginning of the year in Florida, even with uh, Elaine Sortino when she was here. That it's just maybe like a mental block with this team that more comfortable in mass or you know traveling to fields, but this beginning in Florida, the nice weather. It's something that throws them off. So you, you think you can see a change in this team as they continue with regular conference games and regular play that they'll turn this record around. Yeah, definitely. I think also, I mean, this is just me from personal experience, but when it's freezing outside, you know, you have all those practices in the gym. You don't really hit the field until it's you get that first spring. Mm -hmm. And it's a big difference. I mean, you could you take swings, you do that, but even when you're, you know, practicing on the defensive end of things, you know, taking a one hop in the gym is a lot different than taking a one hop mm -hmm. on the field. So I think that that affects the team as well. But um, hopefully with the warmer weather, you know, and getting these whatever first few jitters out um, with these games in Florida, they'll be able to turn it around. Um, they're going to be playing GW this weekend um, in D.C. So hopefully they could, you know, turn that into a win as they enter into conference play. Now, Chris, you mentioned it too with the baseball team taking two of their last three but not really off to a great start overall. Yep. Do you think this team as well has the ability to turn this around with freshmen like Gianella stepping up for this team? Well, talking to a couple of the players, they say uh, Dylan Began, the, uh, the senior first baseman and cleanup hitter, he has two home runs for the team this year, leads the team in home runs and 10 RBIs. So talking to him, he told me that the, the non-conference schedule is just to get them ready for the conference schedule. So that's kind of a fresh start for them. They take it as a fresh start. And obviously they showed that this weekend when they won two out of three. And the, uh, they used the non-conference schedule for, for building as a team, growing, giving the, uh, the young guys some at-bats, everyone getting uh, acquainted together. And while a lot of the games are tough for them because we're a New England team and mm -hmm. the recruiting money is not the same as it is down south and uh, at those big schools, yep. um, they used these games to grow as a team, uh, kind of get in the flow of things. And now that they're uh, ready to go, Two, two and one to start out the A-10 schedule. That's not not too bad for a team that started out one and twelve. So, if if you get guys like Gene Ellis and, and some young guys to step in from McClam in the middle of the lineup, you got a, a nice solid group of uh, seniors out there with Began. You have Nick Compel who's leading the team in, in hits. He's a senior this year, and Adam Picard has shown some uh, some power in the lineup, especially this weekend. He had a couple big uh, RBI singles and in two comeback wins. So. You got some guys who can really uh, show some some power, and and Coach Stone is is is, is excited about it because they started off the season uh, two and three, but on the other hand, he he, he did seem a little uh, upset about the start. So it's kind of a it's a it's a fresh start, and it definitely prepares the team for the A10 schedule because the teams aren't as strong as the non-conference schedule. Yeah, A10 so. schedule is definitely what they're focused on as exactly. well. What matters to them. But what we've seen so far, even in this rough start, there is the offensive depth in this team. There's, like you said, they have the three-hitter, Giannellis, who's stepping up surprisingly. You got your four-hitter you're expecting big things out of, plus good averages and good yeah. runs in RBI being produced 
throughout the rest of the lineup. So, I mean, it's there. The, the production is it's, there. Yeah, it's, it's just now maybe moving this production to their A-10 schedule that will bring more success for this team. Yeah, definitely. It, when you play the A-10 schedule, the pitchers aren't as strong. The, bat, the, the hitters, they, they, they commented that they've, they're seeing better pitchers to hit. The, there's not as strong talent in the A-10 mm. as there is in the non-conference schedule. So that's definitely a plus for UMass. And Dylan Began told me, he said, I still expect us to, to make the A-10 tournament, and he expects to, to, to be a contender in it. So even when you start off the season like that, to, to still have hopes to make your conference tournament, that's, that, that's definitely a positive, for, especially for a UMass team that doesn't get much recruiting money and, and things like that. So Mike Stone, he, uh, he's definitely confident that his team has a chance in the A-10, and that's all you could ask for out of a, out of a UMass baseball team. Yeah, so. definitely. And, you know, it's, it's really it's not surprising that the recruiting money or the recruits are there when we're at the end of March and it's still freezing when they're supposed to be out playing baseball. For sure. Can't really blame the talent <laughs> for staying down south where it's going to be warm in December and they're playing baseball. So it's good to see the productions there. Looking forward to the A-10 schedule. And the women are looking to turn things around off a fresh start. All right. We'll be keeping track of both of these teams for the rest of spring. Chris, Caitlin, thank you. Thank Stay you. tuned, and we'll be right back with the Damo Pool Zone and the Boston Sports Desk. Good evening, UMass. I'm Adamo Pool Zone, and this is your Boston Sports Update. Over spring break, the Boston Bruins managed a 12-game win streak and solidified a spot in the Stanley Cup playoffs. They were looking for their 13th straight victory last night when they hosted the Montreal Canadiens, and despite outplaying Montreal the majority of the game, the game went all the way into shootouts where Canadiens player Alex Galchenyuk scored a fourth-round shootout goal after the game, Bruins coach Claude Julien said, you can't win 12 in a row and lose one in a shootout and say I'm really disappointed in my team. Good news for Red Sox fans, it looks like David Ortiz will play another year in a Red Sox uniform. The 38-year-old designated hitter will most likely end his career here in Boston after agreeing on a $16 million extension for the 2015 season, a $1 million pay bump from the $15 million he'll get paid this year. And the Boston Celtics visited the Barclays Center Friday night where Avery Bradley recorded 28 points However, that wasn't enough as the defense was nowhere to be seen as the Celtics were rooted by a score of 114 to 98. Nets guard Joe Johnson recorded 27 points, 18 of those from beyond the arc. The Nets have been unstoppable at home, making it their 11th straight victory. The Celtics will be back in action tomorrow night at home as they host the Toronto Raptors. The New England Patriots made quite a ruckus over spring break after losing star cornerback Aqib Tlaib to the Denver Broncos on a six-year deal. Patriots fans could only hope the front office would start making moves to fix the defense, and that they did. The Patriots signed former Jet Darrell Rivas on a one-year deal worth $12 million, and former Seahawks player Brandon Browner on a three-year deal worth $17 million. The offense, also, eh, the offense also made some big moves in re-signing star wide receiver Julian Edelman and picking up slot receiver Brandon LaFell from the Carolina Panthers. Unfortunately, it looks like fan favorite defensive tackle Vince Wilfork will not be in a Patriots uniform in the upcoming season. Last week, Wolfork asked for a release from the Patriots, and it was reported today by the Boston Herald that Wolfork angrily ripped his nameplate off of his locker stall and cleaned out his locker room this morning. Oddly enough, Patriots owner Robert Kraft says he still has hope that Wolfork will stay on the team. That's it for this week's Boston Sports Update. We're going to take it back to Casey Johnson in the newsroom. Welcome back to UMass Sports Weekly. Now joining me at the table to discuss men's and women's across, Demi Foley and Cam Murphy. Guys, thanks for joining me. Now, lacrosse is one of the places we look for success at the school. That we're used to them being ranked, and it's something we uh, take a lot of pride in, I would say. I think our lacrosse team has always been very good. And uh, this year, we know, starting with the men's, uh, they've uh, lost some pretty key seniors uh, this past year. But a lot of guys have been stepping up, and we've been seeing some good play out of the team. Cam, why don't you give us a recap of what happened over the spring break? Uh, over spring break, the, coming out, they are 7-2 and ranked 13 in the nation. Um, they had a 1-1 record over a break with an 11-5 loss to Fairfield. Uh, two goals from Nick Mariano, two from Mooney, and one from George. Um, it was an even game, I felt. Um, like, obviously, Fairfield had it, but uh, big goalie for them. Mm -hmm. uh, Ten saves, played really good. So uh, I think that UMass just needs to get some more shots and um, maybe uh, in defense, like, uh, Olivier, Olivier uh, he took a bunch of shots that game, so it's a little defense needs to step up a little bit. Next game uh, on the 22nd was a victory for, uh, over Hartford, 12-6 win. Much better game. Team stepped up a lot more. Um, defense, Olivier took less shots that game, 
had seven saves, but uh, did very good goals. Three goals from Mariano, two from Mooney, and two from Whiteway for uh, the big scores of the game. Also, uh, they really outplayed hard for this game. Uh, outshot them 26-13, a lot more ground balls. They were getting in there, um, being very physical, and uh, overall, step up. So Mariano, I mean, we talked about him at the beginning of the season, freshman coming in that really they weren't, they were looking for him to get playing time, of course, but they weren't really depending on him to be their goal scorer. And so far he has been, and it seems like he continues to be. He's always there with three or two goals every game. Uh, yeah, he's a uh, leading scorer this season with 22 goals on the team. So uh, he's stepping up. Yeah, it's impressive freshman debut. Hopefully he can keep this going, keep this team ranked because... Clearly they need it, like you see in that Fairfield game, the offensive production isn't always there. I mean, yeah. 10 saves, that's an impressive game for that goalie. But it's good to have those freshmen coming, stepping up, and Whiteway as well. He had a big game a couple weeks ago. Good to see him scoring as well. So still seeing some good things from the team. 101 record, but some positive things from the team. Now, women, on the other hand, pretty much lost with them is bad news. We don't like to hear that. They are a very strong team. Are we seeing the same results this year, Demi? Yeah, I mean, just like you said, they're an extremely strong team. There's not much else to say about them, but they've been proven to be really, you know, just unstoppable. They're one out of the six teams that are still undefeated across the country, which is simply unbelievable. We've talked a lot about this team just having great on-the-field chemistry and being extremely cohesive. However, what we've extremely noticed is the relationship between Katie Ferris, who, you know, we followed her success throughout the season a lot, but now recently, Sam Rush, both senior attacks, definitely doing work, carrying the team. Katie Ferris is currently ranked 12th nationally for overall points and third in the country for assists. And Sam Rush on the board ranked 10th for goals. So, you know, when you have a great duo like that, they have a way of knowing exactly what the other is going to do even before they do it. And I think that that's huge. You know, just after pulling out a win against South Carolina, it's given them the fourth best start in lacrosse history, being 9-0. Currently, they're about to play under the lights against number seventh. The ranked number 7th, excuse me, Northeastern. UMass is currently ranked 10th, so we'll see what happens with that game, but they're just proving to be undeniably unstoppable. Yeah, I think we've been pretty familiar with this team, hearing the name Katie Ferris, but mainly hearing it by itself in that she has done a lot of the workload for this team and really has no problem with it. She is an unbelievable lacrosse player. But now in Sam Rush to hear someone that's working beside her and maybe being able to produce just as she does, this could turn this team into one of the best teams in the country, if not one of the best teams we've seen in quite some time. Yeah. So uh, Cam, on the other hand now, 7-2, 13th in the country, very solid start for the boys. Now, we would like to see him undefeated, but that's all right. You know, still, uh, this is still plenty of time for wins to make up for that. But how do you see this team faring in the tournament? We know these are early rankings. We've seen some pretty decent performances. But as the season goes on and it gets deeper, how do you see this team doing? Uh, I think they could be very successful as long as they keep playing. Uh, however, they haven't really played any like very high-ranked teams. They played Penn State. Uh, they were ranked 7th at the time. They beat them 8-6. But now they're ranked seven, or 19th. So, I mean, I think they could as long as they keep playing well. One thing, defense needs to step up a little bit. Mm -hmm. They've faced... Olivia has faced 169 shots this year, so um, it's very high compared to the rest of the league. So um, I think if they can step up there, keep uh, scoring goals and stuff, I think they should be fine. So really just a little more help for Olivieri down there because you can't just give him the entire workload to keep this yeah. team, especially in a game like lacrosse where shots are really hard to come by and a lot of them are goals. Yeah, especially because they stepped up in the Hartford game. Defense did a lot better with uh, having Olivier take less shots and... Uh, as long as they keep going. So maybe they're learning game by game, improving, and as it goes on, the offensive production will get better and the defensive production will get better as well. But good to see these strong performances out of freshmen and especially out of Livieri, who is going to be huge for this team as the season goes on. Demi, now, as we said, this team's a powerhouse. It's hard to doubt them at all. Do you see this team going all the way this year, possible championship? Um, I definitely foresee them potentially going all the way, but if not getting extremely close, you've seen in the past four years just following the seasons, they've furthered themselves each season a little bit more. So they've only been progressing. Now having attacks such as Katie Ferris and Sam Rush, those talents being seniors, being veterans, knowing what it's like to be in you know the A-10 tournament position, mm -hmm. 
I think we're in a great spot to really just come out on top. We talk a lot on UMass Sports Weekly about fraudulent rankings, and this is a UMass team that is not fraudulently ranked by any means. They're not just winning. They're stomping all over teams that are top contenders in this league from all over the country. And so I think that that just goes to show that they are ready and they're a solid team, and we're not going to see any sort of, you know, doubt, any sort of poor play. I think they're in a very good place, and I think they're about to become unstoppable. So very successful starts for both the men's and the women's, and very high hopes as the season continues for both of these teams. Guys, thanks for joining me. Good stuff thanks, there. Casey. And we always thank you at home for watching. And as always, check us out on Facebook, UMass Sports Weekly. Give us a like there. You can check all our full episodes and segments. Also, be sure to follow us on Twitter and Instagram, at UM Sports Weekly there for all your updates on current UMass athletics. And as always, we will be back here same time, same place.